Well, at this time, our kids can be dismissed to Holy Word. We always have our kids join us for... Did the kids leave already? Oh, no, they're leaving now. Okay. <laughs> Sometimes the kids are too eager to leave. Uh, and They've already left before I had a chance to say it. So we, we like to have our kids worship with us, and then we dismiss to uh, kind of age-appropriate teaching. Uh, so where our kids are going to be dismissed to Holy Word there. If you are uh, feeling led to help volunteer in Holy Word. It's not to take over the program, but just help out every once in a while. We'd love to have you help. We're, we're so thankful to everyone who has, uh, who has agreed to help out, and uh, we're looking for a few more volunteers, though, if that's something that you could still help out with. We've got sign-up sheets in the foyer right by the giving tree. As you're taking your uh, ornament there, make sure to also sign up. We've got it very conveniently located <laughs> in the same spots. And, oh, I forgot to announce... Uh, or just to, not to announce, but just to say thank you to uh, our volunteers who came in and decorated the church for Christmas. Doesn't it look amazing? So thank you to all who came in and, uh, and put that together. And Merry Christmas to everybody. Merry Christmas. Uh, the season, the Christmas season is, is here. It's upon us. And this season at church, I wanted to look at the real meaning of Christmas. I mean, it sounds trite. Christmas is always tough for pastors, I think. A little peek behind the curtains. It's always tough for pastors because it's the same. We know the story, right? It's the same story. It's tough to say that same story over and over again and, and uh, look at it maybe from a new angle. And, uh, and there's always a, t a temptation to make the, the big popular holidays uh, uh, kind of a uh, what, the seeker-sensitive, if you've, you've heard that phrase, that there's people that... Uh, and maybe you're one of them that uh, will only show up to church once a year, and it's usually, if you only show up to church once a year, it's probably on Christmas. If you show up twice a year, then you'll add Easter into the mix. And there's always a temptation to give like a nice, warm, uh, lovey-dovey sermon on Christmas and Easter. But I have, I've always resisted that temptation, and my, my Christmas and Easter sermons are always some of my toughest. And I stand by that. I like to preach a tough sermons on Christmas. So here's the first of a series of Maybe difficult Christmas sermons, but uh, one that, that I hope helps us to realize really the heart of what Christmas is all about and what, uh, and what happened in, in Bethlehem those many years ago. One of the big problems with Christmas is the same is one of the big problems I, I see with uh, Christians, with the church, and that is Christmas and Christianity itself has been so ingrained into our culture that it's hard to tell sometimes where the culture of the world ends and Christmas begins, or the culture where the culture of the world ends and where the church begins. The lines have gotten so blurry because it's been so ingrained in our culture. There's people who don't care a bit about God but still celebrate Christmas. The, the lines are blurry there, and it's the same thing in the church, I think. The culture of the world just tends, tends to creep in and kind of take over everything it touches. I'm a, I'm a geeky guy. One of the things I geek out about is uh, outer space. I like outer space. I like outer space and anything geeky. Dinosaurs, uh, Star Wars. I like Star Wars. I like Star Trek. I like all that stuff. And the planet Jupiter, if you're familiar with the planet Jupiter, we're... Uh, it, the planet Jupiter is a gas giant, we call it. It's the biggest planet in our solar system. Here's a picture of it here. It's got a big red spot there. It's a little, got like a birthmark uh, in the corner. It's a big storm. It's a huge storm that's been going on for, uh, for a long, long time. And that storm is bigger than the planet Earth. It's pretty fascinating. But one of the fascinating things about Jupiter to me is uh, here on Earth, we've got a, uh, an atmosphere and that we've got a crust that you stand on, right? So we, there's an atmosphere that we breathe, and it's gas, gaseous, and we breathe it, and we can stand on the crust of the earth, and underneath the crust is the mantle, and it's a, kind of a liquid, and underneath that is a solid core. Now, Jupiter is different. If you were to jump into the planet Jupiter, uh, you would jump into this gaseous mess, and you would go down, 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 all the way to the center, and at no point would you ever reach the surface. Jupiter doesn't have a surface. It's gas, and eventually things turn to liquid, and eventually, people aren't sure, but they assume it turns to a solid somewhere. But there's never, there's never a point where there's a surface of the Earth. There's never a boundary where the, here's the atmosphere and here's the, here's the surface of it. You would just keep kind of going down, and you'd get crushed by the... It'd be a miserable journey. You'd get crushed by the pressure and all that stuff. It'd be horrible. But... Uh, it's just kind of a blob. 
And it starts as gas, and somewhere it ends up solid, but there's no point wherever it, there, there's a, a, a marking line, a boundary here. And I feel it's something similar like how the church looks, I think. We're, there's, there's definitely people who sincerely believe in Jesus and take it very seriously, and there's definitely people who don't, but isn't it very difficult to find out where that line is? It feels like a blob sometimes where we know that there we know that and maybe it feels like that in your life too where there was no defining moment in your life where you came to know Christ I know there, there's people who are who do have that where they said this was the moment this is the second this is the day but then there's also a lot of Christians who say man I, I, I know I am now but I, I don't exactly know when that point was where I would have been that it's kind of like Jupiter you just eventually I got here but I don't know where that line was I don't know where that boundary was um, one of the problems though with it being like that where that 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 Jupiter like structure is we end up with Christians who don't really know if they are Christians or Christians who look exactly the same as the world around them maybe they grew up Christian or they call themselves Christian or they assume that they're Christian but Really, they have all the same beliefs as the world, all the same dreams as the world, all the same hopes as the world. They do all the same things as the world. They post the same things as the world on Facebook. They have the same sins as the world and the same habits of the world, the same sexual practices of the world. And you go, well, what are you? <laughs> are you really a Christian? Or are you just somewhere in the blob and you're, you, you're, you're not really there? Uh, the problem is that because the lines are blurry, sometimes we don't know where we stand. When we think about God, uh, a lot of the times people say, well, God, yeah, he seems like a nice guy. I hope to see him when I die. Uh, it's not like I don't believe in him, but, uh, you know, you, maybe you, I don't really know for sure, and I guess I'll see when I die. And they assume that that's kind of the whole point of God, and maybe that's the whole point of Christmas. But the point of Christmas is the opposite of that. It's not that, yeah, hopefully I'll go to see him one day when I die. It's God came to bring his kingdom here now. That's what Jesus is doing. That's what God is doing at Christmas time. And we're called to live differently now. We're called to give our allegiance to something totally different now, not to wait some time and hopefully maybe it'll all work out in the end. But this problem of blurry lines is nothing new. Uh, every single person who wants to be a follower of God and tries to follow God wrestles with this boundary line. Where, what, what, is, what should I be doing? What should I not be doing? Uh, then this temptation to not want to stick out from the world, but to fit in with the world. Even in the Old Testament, uh, there's several times where God's people begged to look more like the world. They begged God, we want to look more like the world, to the point they even begged God to give them a king, just like the world had a king. God was supposed to be their king uh, himself. He said, I'm going to bring this people out, the people of Israel, and I'm going to be their king, and they won't have any need of a king because I'll be their king. And what do God's people do? They said, well, that's really nice, but I see everybody else has a king. Can't, can't you just give us a king like everybody else has? And God says, are you serious? <laughs> I, you, I'm your king. And they say, well, actually, we just want to look like everybody else. I want to share this story in, in 1 Samuel 8. And uh, Samuel was uh, a great leader of the, the tribes of Israel. But Samuel was getting old, and his kids were taking over, and his kids weren't as good as the father. And everybody said, ah, uh, can, we, can we just get a king here and stop this nonsense? So listen to, listen to how this went down with God. It said, all the elders of Israel gathered together, and they came to Samuel at Ramah. And they said to him, you're old, and your sons don't follow your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as all the other nations have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It's not you that they've rejected, but they've rejected me as their king. As they have done from the day I brought them out, out of Egypt until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, so they are doing to you. Now listen to them, but warn them solemnly, and let them know what the king who will reign over them will claim as his rights. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. And he said, This is what the king who will reign over you will claim as his rights. 
He said, you, you want a king, but do you really want to know what that means for you? Here's what that means. He said, the king will take your sons and make them serve with his chariots and horses in the army, and they will run in front of his chariots. Some he will assign to be commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and others to plow his ground and reap his harvest, and still others to make weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and your vineyards and olive groves and give them to his attendants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage, and he will give it to his officials and his attendants, your male and female servants, and the best of your cattle and donkeys. He's going to take for his own use. He will take a tenth of your flocks, and you yourselves will become his slaves. When that day comes, you'll cry out for relief from the king that you have chosen, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. But, verse 19, the people refused to listen to Samuel. No, they said, we want a king over us. Then we will be like all the other nations, with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. And this part isn't in your insert, but the, here's, how, here's how it concludes. It says, When Samuel heard all the people that all the, what all the people said, he repeated it before the Lord, and the Lord answered, Listen to them and give them a king. And so that's the story of how Israel got their first king. They begged to look just like the world. And it's the same thing today. I think there's just a desire in each and every one of us that we don't want to stick out. We want to look like the world. And can we do that? And the amazing thing I think we see is that God condescends to us. Even though we're asking for something that's going to hurt us in the long run, he says, look at this king. He's going to tax you. He's going to put you in his army. And they said, yeah, yeah, we'll take that. And God says, oh, okay, okay. Give it to him. Uh, he allows us to go our own way. He says, you, you know, you're going to get in trouble if you go in your own way. You're going to get in trouble. You're going to get hurt if you look like the world. Uh, it's going to lead to pain. That's how the world's kingdom always ends up. It always ends up in hurt and pain and darkness. And each one of us has that choice to make. Which one are we going to follow? Which kingdom are we going to want to be a part of? Which king are we going to follow, God or the way the rest of the world does it? Are we going to follow God as our king? Or are we going to look like the rest of the world? And the world, the lure of the world is very tempting. It might be the one big temptation that all of us face. Jesus says the, the worries of the world and the cares of the world and the temptations of the world and the wealth of the world drag so many people away. Over and over again, when you see in Jesus' ministry, whether it's his parable about uh, scattering seeds on different kinds of soil, and some seeds grow up for a little bit, but then the worries of the world and the cares of the world uh, make the plant fall away. Or when Jesus got a great a number of followers, he did uh, great miracles with feeding thousands of people with just some fish and some bread, and he had lots of people following him. But as Jesus continued teaching, some of his teaching was very difficult, and he got thousands of people following him because he could do cool things, but then thousands of people left when his teaching got difficult. And they said, well, forget this. I, I kind of like the Jesus that gives me stuff, <laughs> but I don't like this Jesus that tells me to do things. And at one point, he just had his 12 disciples with him. And he said to his disciples, are you going to leave me too? And Peter, one of his disciples, said, where else are we going to go? Like, I don't like what you're saying, Jesus, but where else are we going to go? Who else has the words of eternal life, Peter says. And it was a great a thing that Peter doesn't always say the right thing, but in that one, I think he got right that as hard as it might be, Jesus, I'm going to stick with you because I know the world doesn't have eternal life. I've seen what the world has, and it doesn't have much to offer me. But that temptation is always there to, to pull us away. Paul wrote to his friend Timothy about their mutual friend Demas in, in 2 Timothy 4. And as Paul, who has been locked up in prison for preaching the gospel, certainly the, the gospel, the spreading the good news about Jesus, didn't treat Paul a really, really nicely. And you look at Paul's life, and he was uh, shipwrecked, he was beat, he was whipped, he was thrown in jail, he went hungry. He, his life was one of pain and misery. You could say, hey, Paul, why don't you just quit that stuff? You're not, you don't seem to be getting much out of it. Why don't you just quit the whole Jesus thing? But Paul knew, like what Peter knew. No, because this is the kingdom that has eternal life. And as Paul writes a letter to his friend Timothy in jail, he says in 2 Timothy 4, verse 9, he says, Do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas, our friend Demas, 
Because he loved this world, he deserted me, and he went to Thessalonica. He just, Demas said, you know what? Kind of forget this whole thing. I, I can get enough stuff from the world. I, maybe he had a good job lined up. And that's the lure of the world. Jesus said, you cannot serve two masters. You're either going to love the one or hate the other one, or hate the one and love the other one, but you can't serve two Choose this day whom you will serve, Joshua, Joshua said in the Old Testament. As for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. But God it lets it, uh, gives, it, gives that choice to each and every one of us. And what most people try to do, what, what most people even in the church try to do, I think, is that we try to have a little bit of both. We try to have one foot in the kingdom of the world and one foot in the kingdom of God. We try to get a little bit of stuff that we like from Jesus and we, and we take a little bit of stuff we like from other places and we cut out the things we don't like about Jesus. We treat Jesus like a side dish. You know, Thanksgiving, you get to choose everything you want and here's a little bit of Jesus over here. You say, oh, we'll have to put a little Jesus on here. Oh, and I'll put a little gravy over here and I'll take a little bit of this. And I don't want too much of Jesus, though. Ugh. You know, who wants too much of Jesus? I don't want, and we treat him like that, but you're not supposed to. The point of Jesus, when you picture, when you see little baby Jesus there, you're not supposed to take a little piece of him, right? That's not right. You, it's either the whole thing or it's nothing. Jesus came as our king or, he came, or just ignore him, you know? There's no in-between. You can't have a little piece of it. You know the great Christmas sermon? Uh, <laughs> uh, Jesus is not supposed to be a nice addition to your life. That's not the point of Jesus. That's not why Jesus came. That's not why we celebrate Christmas. Christmas is not just a time where everybody says, oh, you know, we ought to be a little bit nicer to everybody. No, that is not the point of Christmas. What is Christmas? Matthew uh, puts it this way, and the scripture was at the end of the video. Matthew chapter 4, verse 16, the people living in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. And in Jesus' ministry, Matthew adds, and from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. What's he saying? You've got a new king now. The kingdom of heaven is brought in to the kingdom of the world. We've been living in darkness, but God is not satisfied for his people to live in darkness, so he's bringing his kingdom here, and he's showing up as king. And you don't take a little bit of the king. You say, well, I kind of follow the king. No, you follow the king or you follow the world. Christmas means that a new king has broken in. And this new kingdom and this new king offers you a choice. It's his or the world's, but make no mistake, Jesus came as king. And he has no desire for you to just think of him as a nice person or a great uh, philosopher or a great teacher or maybe even a good example. Uh, he is king or he is nothing. C.S. Lewis puts it this way in Mere Christianity. He says, you must make your choice. Either this man Jesus was and is the son of God or else he was a madman or something worse. A great teacher wouldn't say the kind of things that Jesus says unless Jesus really was the son of God. You can shut Jesus up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. Jesus has not left that option open to us, and he did not intend to. The proclamation of Jesus' followers right from the beginning and the proclamation of the church throughout the ages has always been, Jesus is Lord. If you want a summation of the whole Bible, or if you want a summation of the whole New Testament, in three words, very simple, Jesus is Lord. That's the whole That's the whole. Thing. <laughs> uh, and there's a connotation to that that we don't often realize. As we go out and we say Jesus is Lord, as the church has always done, uh, that cry is nothing new. At the time of Jesus, the people in the Roman Empire had a phrase that they said all the time, and that was Caesar is Lord. That was the phrase that everybody used. Caesar is Lord. He's our Savior. He saved us from the enemies. He's delivered us from uh, our, you know, the people we're at war against. He's defended us, and he offers us his protection. Caesar is Lord. Give your allegiance to Caesar. And then here comes this little group of people who follow this Jewish construction worker, and they have a different cry of the world. And their cry is that Jesus is Lord. And when we confess that Jesus is Lord, and when we confess it, we're also saying, and Caesar is not. When we say that Jesus is Lord, we're saying he is our king, 
and no one else is. When we say that Jesus is Lord, when we confess that, we're also saying, and by the way, I'm not Lord. Jesus is Lord, that means I'm not the king of my life. I don't get to decide. He is, and he decides, uh, he decides what is best for my life. And the beauty of Jesus is that he is a king not like any other king. He's a king who steps down off his throne and comes to rescue each and every one of us individually. He's a king who watches his children abandoning him, getting in trouble, getting hurt, and then turning around and yelling at him like it's his fault. But nevertheless, he comes and he suffers defeat and he suffers death on the cross for people who don't even care about him. He's a king unlike any other king. And like the parable says in the, of the prodigal son, he's a king who's always there with open arms, ready and willing for us to come back to him. He's a king who shows up in the darkness, ready to give us light and opens that door for each and every one of us. But if Jesus is our Lord, and that's the challenge of Christmas, is Jesus our Lord or not? And if Jesus is, then this world is not your kingdom. You live in a different kingdom now if Jesus is your king. We are what the Bible refers to us as exiles and foreigners in this world. We're we're in the world, but we're not of the world because Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. We get so worked up. I see Christians getting worked up, and I myself, I'm guilty of this as well. Uh, We get so worked up because the world looks crazy, doesn't it? And maybe you get on social media, you watch the news, and uh, you go, why in the world does this world look so crazy? It's one of the reasons I can't do social media anymore because I I want to think highly of these people. I want to, I, I respect these people, and then I see what they post, and I go, oh, my word. Uh, so for your sake, uh, I'm off social media, so I don't see the kind of things that you post. Sometimes people say, did you see what so-and-so posted? <laughs> no, no, because I, I can't. I, I would prefer to think better of them, so I can't do social media. But we get worked up because the world looks crazy, and I think we forget, oh, wait, yeah, no, the world is crazy. It is. This is what the kingdom of darkness looks like. And and why are we getting so worked up that the kingdom of darkness looks like darkness? Why are we getting so worked up that the kingdom of the world doesn't look like the kingdom of God? Of course it doesn't look like the kingdom of God. That's why Jesus came, to show a new way, to bring in a new kingdom. Don't get get worked up that non-Christians don't act like Christ. (laughs) We have a great commission to preach the good news of Jesus to the world, but you know when the early followers of Jesus went out into the world, they didn't get angry that the world wasn't acting like Christ. They knew it wasn't acting like Christ. The problem we have now is that the lines are blurry, and we think somehow, yeah, the world ought to get its act together and ought to be more like Jesus. Don't act like people who don't care about Jesus should act like Jesus. Uh, And Uh, get frustrated instead that the church looks just like the world. Get frustrated with those boundaries and beware the lures of the world. Uh, We need to be strong and remain faithful to our king. That's going to look like uh, you not looking like the world. That's going to look like the world looking stranger and stranger as you get closer and closer to Jesus. But not that you would have more and more hatred toward the world, but you'd have more and more compassion toward the world that they're living in darkness and they need light. Um, But it's also going to mean tension because people who take their walk with God seriously are are a minority in this world, and they always have been. Uh, In in Livingston County right now, uh, the percentage in Livingston County of people who uh, check that they're religious on the polls is 37.8%. So 37.8% of the people in Livingston County are religious. 20% of those is Catholic. I'll just leave that there. But uh, those are the numbers. Now, does this surprise us? Are we shocked by this? I was a little bit shocked by it when I saw it, but uh, that number is actually a little bit higher than, than across the whole state of Michigan. So Livingston County is a little bit even better, I say a little bit more religious than the, the rest of Michigan as a whole, but it's about the same. But that's a number as a minority, we realize. And it's always been that way, though. Even in the Old Testament, with God as their king, and they had the temple, and the the Bible was their constitution, it was the nation of Israel, and they were known as God's kingdom. When you read the prophets, every single one of the prophets are saying, almost every single one of the prophets are saying, 
why is no one taking this seriously? Every single one of the books to the Old Testament to the nation of Israel is, come on, we're supposed to take this seriously. Why is taking God seriously the thing that's rare to do? In fact, one of the prophets, Elijah, said he, he was worried. He thought he was the only one. He says, I look around the nation of Israel, I think I might be the only one who follows God, who takes him seriously. And God had to comfort Elijah and say, no, I've got 7,000 others here. I've got 7,000 others that, are, that follow me. And it was a relief to Elijah, but it's also a realization. Only 7,000? Really? That's, that's the percentage that, that follows God and takes him seriously? But that's, that's, the, real, that's the reality of it, folks. The, the, it, it's, it's a minority. It's not, we're not going to look like the world if we're going to follow Jesus seriously. Now, I'm a, I'm a very bad salesperson in life and uh, just in general. I just, I don't have that salesperson bone. I tried to sell, you can probably tell at this sermon, you think, geez, Chad, <laughs> it's not a Christmas sermon, this is what you're talking about? Uh, I'm not good at that. I don't have that talent or whatever it was. I tried selling vacuum cleaners once door to door before I realized I was not a good salesperson and I was miserable. I, I did not sell one vacuum cleaner and I ended up having to sell my, my plasma just to survive. I donate my plasma like every time I could before I realized, oh, I'm, I'm a, I, I know what it is. I'm a bad salesperson. People say, maybe I should get this vacuum. And I go, nah, it's pretty expensive. <laughs> These things are kind of ridiculous. And uh, anyway, so I'm not, I'm glad that we have Christians and, and, and uh, followers of Jesus who are good salespeople for Jesus. But it's just not my strong suit. Um, and maybe you're wondering, well, what is the benefits? You haven't talked much about the benefits of following Jesus. Uh, and sometimes people talk about Jesus that way, like they'll have a chart and they'll say, well, look, Jesus is such a great investment for you here. You know, your, your kingdom's not going to last, and everybody knows that our kingdoms don't last, and eventually it's all going to end in darkness. The, one out of every one people, I just read this statistic, one out of every one people die. You realize the kingdom... Your kingdom is not going to last. And so, in a sense, Jesus is a good investment. But I don't, I'm not trying to preach safety today. Following Jesus sometimes may not be safe. It may be difficult. It may be hard. Uh, and following Jesus is, is not so much safety as it is an adventure. As, as it is him calling you into a different kingdom, a different way of life. And sometimes it's crazy. His kingdom is crazy, and it go, it's so counterintuitive to the way we may think and the way we may live. Uh, Jesus, I'm not sure, is, well, he is a safe invest, investment, but living with Jesus is not safe. Living with Jesus uh, is, is the, he's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords, and he's not, he's not a safe king. He's not a safe Lord, but he's a powerful Lord, and he's a good Lord, and he's going to take care of you, and he's going to put you down a path that he knows is best for you, even if it may not feel good in the long run. Not if you're safe enough to follow him. I think if you're brave enough to follow him. Uh, the, and the closer you follow Jesus the crazier it seems to get. When you first start following Jesus, maybe you realize, oh, I got to clean up. Yeah, I do have to clean up the way I talk. And uh, yeah, I, okay, I got to polish up some things. And Jesus is there to polish up some things for you. But the more you follow Jesus, you realize, oh, he's not content to just polish me up a little bit. He wants to make me somebody totally new. Maybe he's going to call me to stop doing this. And I really like that. Maybe he's going to call me to start doing this. And I, I would never want to do that on my own, but he's, I feel like he's calling me to do this. Maybe Jesus is calling me to give this great big amount that the world would say, what are you, nuts? Uh, maybe Jesus is calling me to a new job or a new state or a new country. I mean, following Jesus is, is, is an adventure. Who knows what he has planned for you? It's a wild kingdom, but it's a kingdom of transformation and might and glory, and power, and light, and how, no matter how difficult it may be, we need to say, like Peter said, but yeah, it may be difficult, but where else are we going to go? To the darkness? No, Jesus, you have the words of eternal life, and I'm sticking with you. When you see baby Jesus this year, don't just see Jesus as another cute little baby that we say, oh, that's a cute little baby. Uh, see Jesus for who he is. God is bringing a new king into this world. God is bringing a new kingdom into this world, crashing right into the middle of your kingdom. And Jesus' kingdom will destroy 
things of the old kingdom. And sometimes it doesn't feel good. But when you are faithful to his kingdom and his kingship above everything else, when you make a break from the ways of the world and you make a stand and you say, my allegiance is now to a different king, I don't know what's in store for you. It's going to be a wild ride. Uh, but it won't be like anything else the world can offer or the world has to offer. And you'll have a deep peace inside your soul that Jesus has came to break you free from that. And he's going to send you on a new mission, a new mission for his kingdom. And it's going to be, I don't know what it'll be, but it'll be something. <laughs> Amen? Uh, I'm going to close this in prayer. Lord, we are a world that is not, that is like the video said, it's just like the world was when Jesus came. The lines are blurry. Maybe the boundary lines look different for us, but it's a confusing place, and it's full of darkness, and Lord, we confess that the darkness has, has sunk into our life and sunk into our bones and sunk into our homes, Lord, and there's lots of hopelessness now, God, and there's lots of pain there's lots of worry and anxiety, Lord, and we confess there's lots of sin. But Lord, you came to break the chains of all those things. You came to bring us into a new kingdom, a kingdom of light where sins are exposed, where lies are revealed for what they are, where worries fall away, Lord, and where we cling to you as, as our hope, as our only hope, God. And so, Lord, this Christmas season, I just... Once again, just rededicate myself to you, Lord. You are my king. The world is not my king. I am not my own king. You are my king, God. And I want to follow you wherever you lead me, Lord, wherever you take me, because your kingdom is good, and your kingdom is light, and your kingdom is power, and your kingdom is forgiveness, Lord. Thank you so much for everything that you gave to break into our lives, to come crashing into our lives, Lord. When we didn't even realize we need it, you were there. And so we give you thanks, and we give you praise, and we give you glory, and we give you honor. And we give those things only to you, God, and to nothing else in this world. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, amen. Well, you're dismissed. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Merry Christmas. We'll see you hopefully next.